Coming up on Car Advice, the return of the muscle car wars. We unleash the Chevy Camaro against the Ford Mustang in the ultimate US horsepower cage fight. Performance saloons, we review the Mercedes AMG C43 wagon to see what the toned down version of the fire breathing C63S brings to the party. And the legendary Land Rover Defender. When is it arriving? What does it look like? And how will you get your hands on one? Welcome to Car Advice, I'm Trent Nikolic. Thank you for joining us. Plenty happening in the automotive world again, as usual. With me at the desk, Paul Marrick. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Thanks for joining us. First up, we're going to look at the Chevy Camaro versus the Ford Mustang. Who comes out on top and why? Classic muscle car battle, that one. The Mercedes-Benz AMG C43 Estate. So we're going to take a look at what sets this luxury wagon apart from its ferocious big brother, the C63S. And the 2020 Land Rover Defender will spill the beans on the new version of the iconic British off-roader. I know, we can't wait for that one. First up, though, we're going to take a look at the 2019 Kia Cerato GT. We've got details on pricing and spec. Straight off the bat, this is a very, very significant vehicle for Kia in Australia. And the Cerato's been lagging behind the segment a little bit. So this is a big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal, yep. but thankfully it's gone off without a hitch because the new Serato hatch is fantastic. I've just had the chance to do a big range review, which yep. you'll see on the Car Advice website shortly. Yep. Uh, but it is a cracking machine, and the GT takes it up a notch because while the rest of the range is naturally aspirated, the GT is turbocharged. Mm. So you get kind of like a warm hatch, and the pricing's pretty sharp as well. $31,990 drive away. Yeah. But get this. <laughs> the recommended retail price is $32,990. Right. Which is a bit odd. It's $1,000 more, isn't it? Well, it's $32,990 plus on-road costs, mm. but it's cheaper with a drive away. $31,990. So it's kind of a, a weird strategy to launch a brand new car and immediately offer drive away pricing. I think there's a reality here with some of the manufacturers that they can actually be a little more competitive yeah. than the initial pricing might indicate. That's probably what Kia is doing here with the Serato GT. Kia have shown that they're capable of building a performance car. We yeah. know with the Stinger that they showed they could do Proceed. it. Proceed. Proceed. Yeah. Stable mate Hyundai's had I30N yeah. of late. The South Korean manufacturers really know what they're doing now, and I think this vehicle's primed to take some sales. That's it. I mean, 150 kilowatts of power, yeah. 265 newton metres of torque. The interior is beautiful. You yeah, get a flat bottom good. steering wheel, yeah. red stitching across the, the cabin, and you get a fantastic 8 inch infotainment system with Apple CarPlay, Android Auto. It really is a cracking car to drive. So, can't wait to spend a bit more time behind the wheel. And if you do want something that's a little bit quick mm. but still has that seven-year warranty, yeah. it's a car to look out for. Caradvice.com for all the pricing and specification details. <laughs> now, Paul, at the recent Detroit Motor Show yep. that no Australian journalists were at, funnily enough, there was nothing go going on over there for us, Ford announced the new Ford Mustang Shelby GT500. Yep. And the best news for Australian viewers is... It's not coming here. Oh, well, that's handy. Yeah, that's isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Let's move along. No. 522 oh. kilowatts, which is 700 horsepower yeah. in the old money. This um, you know, 0 to 100 in 3.6-ish seconds. This is the most powerful Mustang that's ever been built. Yep. Why can't we buy it here? It makes no sense. Look, it is strange. Uh, carbon fibre drive shaft. Yep. It is a monster of yeah, a car, monster. quarter mile in under 11 seconds. Yeah. So it is certified quick. It uses a 5.2 litre supercharged V8. Now, explain this to me. <laughs> There's probably an answer here that I, I haven't looked into, but mm. why is that the old Mustang? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I don't know. Maybe they've been developing it for a while, but it doesn't make any sense, does it? That, the fact that it's the old Mustang doesn't make any sense, and the fact that we can't get it here. I mean, Ford can't import enough Mustangs to sell. Precisely. They're that popular here. This thing would drive out of showrooms on its own, surely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you can get older versions of the Shelby as right-hand drive conversions in Australia, but given this thing will probably, they haven't announced pricing yet, but probably going to be 70, 80, maybe even 90,000 US dollars. Yeah, by the time you get it here, mm. you'll be 200k deep into this thing. So mm. is it that much better than a normal Mustang that you could, I guess, just do performance mods on in Australia? Jury's out on it. Tell you what, advice at caradvice.com. Why don't you let us know whether you'd buy the most powerful Mustang ever built if it was available in Australia? A brand that nobody really thinks of when it comes to performance cars is Lexus. You know, you ask yeah. the average person on the street about Lexus and they'll say really well built, value packed, reliable luxury Toyota. cars. Oh, luxury cars. Yeah, no, not Toyotas, no, but <laughs> they might, well, yeah, exactly. Um, People don't think of Lexus being hardcore track. Yeah. 
focused at all. So they released, at the Detroit Motor Show as well, they released a track-ready coupe that's ready to go racing, basically. Yeah. Uh, it shows a little bit of intent from Lexus, doesn't it? I think with the LC that they released, you know, recently, yep. not that long ago, they're starting to show that they've got a little bit more interest in performance than punters might have thought. That's it, and it's a it's a company that really has some fantastic engines yeah. on offer, and the five litre naturally aspirated V eight that's fitted to that is one of them. Mm. It uh, it makes a pretty impressive three hundred and fifty one kilowatts of power, five hundred and thirty newton metres of torque. And have a look at it; it looks mm. mean. You've got carbon ceramic brakes. Yeah. It has a weight reduction as well, sixty five kilos less. So you really are getting a lot of meat here. Mm. It's coming to Australia in May this year. Obviously, it's not going to find itself in the home of many <laughs> Australian driveways, but I think if you are keen on your Lexuses and you want a car that really stands out, this could be the one to go for. They released it alongside a facelift of this yeah. car as well, and it's looking much better now. It kind of looked a bit strange at the front previously. The facelift doesn't have that grill at the front that looks like, if you've watched the Batman movies, it looks like that mask that Bane was wearing. It's, <laughs> it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but everywhere else it looks great. There's just a couple of little design touches that don't exactly gel with the rest of the car. looks tough, though. Uh, and I think it's a further mark from Lexus to say we can build performance sports cars. What I love to bring to the TV show is a comparison that Kurt and I have done yes. that's extremely hard work. Okay, good. So, so SUVs what, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, SUVs or, you know, that sort of middle of the road, you know, Camry versus Mazda 6, that kind of stuff. Really exciting thing. So this week... What we've brought to the table, what I've brought to the table, Camaro versus Mustang. Excellent. Yeah, that's right. Rear-wheel drive V8 performance cars. Precisely cars. what I've been looking for. Absolutely <laughs> right. Now, let's, let's first discuss pricing because yep. we know Mustang has been incredibly popular in Australia. Oh, yeah. We already know that. They're walking out of the showrooms. You know, people can't get enough of them. The bullets sold out. Yep. Anything they do here goes crazy. Mustang, I think, is incredibly good value for money. Absolutely. The kicker with this... Uh, test here in Australia is that the Camaro is a low volume right hand drive converted vehicle by Walkinshaw in yes. Victoria uh, and it starts at around about the $80,000 mark. So you're going to be paying up around 90 grand, that which is, is a lot of money. It is. It's give or, give or take 20 odd thousand dollars more than the Mustang. Yeah. Now, in America, these things go head to head. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to say, would you buy Camaro or would you buy yeah. a Mustang? For the purposes of this test, we've tried to put the price as much as we can to one side mm -hmm. and compare them together as two vehicles because okay. there's a couple of factors there. One, I think if you're a dyed-in-the-wool General Motors yep. fan, you're not going to buy a Mustang. No. If you're a dyed-in-the-wool yeah. Ford fan, you're not going to buy right. a Camaro. So I think we've put that out of the way and said, let's try and find out which is the best sure. vehicle, regardless of what colour your uh, contact lenses are and the <laughs> price. Now, straight up, straight off the bat, Camaro's got a 6.2 litre engine, yes. which is bigger than the Ford's engine, yep. so it must be better, mustn't it? Well, I mean, I like numbers, and <laughs> exactly. I know that bigger numbers are always bigger better is always when it comes better. to engines. Yeah, absolutely. So they've ditched the LS3, it yep. now uses a, a better version of the 6.2 litre LT1, and you've got 339 kilowatts, so that's the same as the Ford. That's yes. a hell of a lot of power, yep. to be honest and 617 newton metres. So a That's little a bit lot as well for a naturally aspirated. Hell of a lot of torque, absolutely. Yeah. Now, what I found um, for me is that the automatic, which is an eight-speed in the Camaro, I think works better with that engine yes. than the 10-speed does in the Mustang. I really think that there's a big difference there. And for me, if I was buying a Mustang, I'd get a manual. Yep. And having just driven the bullet, I never thought I'd say that because, to be honest with you, a big, lazy American V8's yeah. always made more sense yeah. with an automatic. But for me, having driven the bullet recently... That manual is excellent. And the, the thing I, I have to interject with, 10-speed auto in the Mustang, it's kind of a bit too much. Too many gears. A, a gearbox that size works really well with a turbocharged or a forced induction engine because yep. you can lean on the torque band to get the most out of it. When it comes to naturally aspirated engines, it needs to start diving through gears. And the thing that I find really frustrating with these is when you want to take over with the paddle shifters, if the car's sort of lazy and moving along in 10th gear, mm. you literally need to start <laughs> rowing yeah. back through 12 gears yeah. before you actually get anywhere That's that you right. need to be. So yeah. it is kind of a misnomer here in the Mustang that more is better. Well, the other thing too with that is they go looking for economy, these yeah, gearboxes exactly. as well, the way they're tuned. So when you're doing 30 or 40 kilometres an hour, it'll start hunting up through the gears to look for economy. And then, as you said, you end up being in 7th, 8th or yep. 9th at 50 k's an hour. I have two questions for yes. you. First I'll have one. two answers. Okay. <laughs> Which one sounds better? Because I know the updated oh, Mustang sounds bloody awesome. The, okay. First of all, Mustang sounds unreal. For yes. me, the Camaro sounds better. We put microphones... At idle or when it's moving? Under load. Okay. So yep. we put uh, microphones near the exhaust to get some drive-by sound for the video mm -hmm. that we shot, which you can see at caradvice.com. It sounds like a NASCAR. 
That's at cool. red line, it sounds like a NASCAR. It's crazy. Okay, second question. Yep. Are they practical at all in terms of being four seats? Ah, now that's really interesting. In that's really interesting. I think if I said to the viewers, mm -hmm. which car do you think is the bigger car physically, they'd all say Camaro. Yep. It's not. Oh, right. The Mustang is a bigger vehicle. So the Mustang has a little bit more usable space in the cabin. Okay, yep. Now, the problem with the Mustang in the second row is the crash rating, as we've discussed before. Yeah, it's abysmal. Yeah. Exactly. But if you're just talking about space, neither of them are particularly good, but the Mustang is better. I think if you had someone in the front passenger seat yep. that wasn't super tall, you could have someone behind them. Our driving position in the driver's seat, forget about it yeah, in either yep. vehicle. What I do like about both of them, though, is they've got usable boot space. Yes. So if you're yep. using it, you know, as a husband and wife or two, a couple going away for the weekend, you can actually fit enough luggage in the boot for it to be useful for that purpose, yep. which not a lot of sports cars can do. Can I tell you what I love about these American yeah, absolutely. cars? Yeah, yeah. So Mustang in the States come, comes with a feature called line lock mode, mm, yes. which is a mode where it disables the rear brakes. Mm. You can load up the throttle yeah. on the brake and just do a giant burnout. Mm. Awesome. Yep. It also comes with a drag mode, <laughs> so it will give you staging lights yeah. on the tachometer mm. that you then know when to take off. I mean, this is so cool. For a and yet, in head. Australia, burnout mode or, or oh, line yeah. lock mode is deactivated. Yeah, the good cute. news, though, for General Motors fans is all you have to really do is just mash the throttle and yeah. it does a burnout. Exactly. I, and look, the other thing that I'd really like to take a look at here and discuss is the ride quality, because I know yes. you've done a fair bit of testing in Mustang. I hadn't driven Camaro before this test. I wouldn't have expected this, but the Mustang actually rides better around town. Yep. I, I'd say the Camaro's got a little bit of an edge on the Mustang in outright handling terms at speed on a twisty road. Uh, make no mistake that these are extremely powerful rear-wheel drive cars, oh, yeah. so you have to know what you're doing, especially if the road's a little damp. You need to know what you're doing to keep them in a straight line. But crucially, most people aren't driving like that every day. You might go yeah. to track days, you might go and hit a twisty road and yeah. have a bit of fun on a weekend, but the reality is you're driving to and from work on pretty average urban roads, and the Mustang, that adaptive suspension or the Magna ride that they have is so good over average surfaces, it's unbelievable. Okay, so we know price, performance. Yep. Which one is quicker in a straight line? Yeah, look, it depends how it depends how well you can get them off the mark. Yep. For me, it's not so much about that though. I mean, you know, the drag mode. Yeah, I guess that has something to do with it. And you know, you, you might argue that people who modify these cars are going to do that. I think it's more about which one stirs the soul the yep. most. Because I think if you're parting with this kind of money for what is a retro muscle car, mm. it's got to be about which one stirs the soul. And for me, as close as this is. I came away from this test saying I'd buy the Camaro. Okay. Now, Kurt, who I did the test with, said he'd buy the Mustang, which is really interesting. It doesn't help anyone, does no, it? No, it doesn't help anyone at all. <laughs> so basically, what we've come to here is if you're a General Motors fan, buy the Camaro. Yep. If you're a Ford fan, buy the Mustang. But to be honest, go to caradvice.com, <laughs> read the review. You can see all of our testing there. For me, though, Camaro, which one would you buy? You've put me on the spot here. Um, look, probably <laughs> yeah. just on looks alone, it'll yeah. be the Mustang. Yeah. But I have driven the Camaro before and I really liked it. So yeah. I'd have both. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, why not? One of each. <laughs> I wish Australians bought more wagons. Yes. Now, we, talk, we talk about this a lot at Car Advice. Everybody rushes out to buy an SUV. Yep. A lot of people that buy a compact SUV could have bought a hatchback. So, you know, you buy something like a Mazda CX-3, you mm -hmm. could have bought a Mazda 3, yep. would have been smarter. A lot of people that rush out and buy an SUV could have bought a wagon if it's a medium or large yep. SUV. Yep. And one wagon that we've tested recently that I love is the Mercedes-AMG C43. So not the C63 that you might be familiar with, but it's little brother. Not quite as aggressive, not quite as powerful, but still pretty cool. Yeah, but also not quite as AMG. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I have an issue true. with this. So AMG is one man, one engine. Yes. That was the whole concept. Mm. It was hand built. Mm. Well, that's not. The 43 range is not. Our CEO says, would you rather a bloke that's in a bad mood, that's had an argument with his wife, didn't get the lunch that he yep. wanted, come in and assemble your engine, or a robot that won't make a mistake? Uh, look, to me, it's all about cachet. <laughs> and <laughs> AMG course. means noise. Yeah. And to me, uh, that is the only reason I wouldn't buy that over a C63. Right. Because the C63 is mental. And, and the, the way I look at it, C63, you can... You can drift, yeah, it does burnouts. Yeah. Whereas this is all-wheel drive, it's quite a safe option and it feels very Audi in that sense. Yeah, it does, but I'm looking at the power figures here. So twin-turbo 3-litre V6, 287 yeah. kilowatts, 
Um, it was 270, it's gone up. Yep. 520 Newton metres between 2500 and 5000 RPM. So that's a pretty potent power and torque delivery for day-to-day -day driving. Yep. And regardless of whether you like the platform, I think all-wheel drive is pretty good. I think for the average punter that doesn't really want mm. a brawny, tail-happy, rear-wheel drive performance vehicle, I think all-wheel drive... get a medium-sized SUV yeah, well, then. <laughs> No, don't do that. <laughs> don't recommend that anybody does that. I think all-wheel drive is a pretty good option. But regardless of the drivetrain and the engine... I think this wagon body style mm. is something that Europeans love. Yep. They really do. Americans, to a lesser extent, love them. In Australia, it's as if they don't exist. Yeah, and look, one of my all-time favourite cars is the Audi RS6. Yep. That is Avant only. Mm. It is a stunning piece of machinery. Absolutely. It hauls. It is really cool. But the problem the C43 has is, I guess, the price. $110,000 before on-road costs. And the reason I say that is the Audi S4 Avant which is one of the smoothest engines and one of the best riding wagons, performance wagons in that segment, is $102,000. So you're almost 10% cheaper mm. for a car that has a better interior, yeah. is arguably better to drive, and then you also have um, you know, other contenders in yeah. that segment that line it up as well. So, look, I, I think it's a commendable car. They actually sound good. I've heard of Yeah, they do sound pretty good. Not they so much excellent. at idle, but they do sound good yeah. once you get into them a little bit. Interestingly, you were talking about competitors at that price point. We mentioned C63 before. Yeah. Um, is your more AMG C63 worth $52,000 more? No, and no. it only drives the rear wheels, not the front? That I've got a slight issue yeah. with. <laughs> yeah, 52,000 issues yeah. with. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of money, money isn't it? Um, but I just I can't get enough of the C63. I just mm. think it is the ultimate brawn machine. It mm. sounds excellent and it goes like you wouldn't believe. It comes with launch control. It really is that whole beautiful package. I'll be keen to see how they go down the track once they integrate a bit of hybrid technology yep. into these cars yep. because hybrid technology is the next step for extracting more speed because mm. it is now just a game. Like the, the part of the only reason you'd go to an all-wheel drive is to get a better 0 to 100 time. Correct. You'll probably see the next generation of C63 being all-wheel drive as well. Mm. Hybrids will be the next frontier. Well, we're seeing all-wheel drive even in supercars. You know, yep. obviously 911's been doing it for a while, Audi R8, Lamborghini does it now too. It's really the only option. Interestingly, this all-wheel drive system... 31% to the front wheel, 69 to the rear axle. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting system in the way that it works. It's not a true 50-50 split, obviously. Uh, I think there is the reality, though, that the more powerful these vehicles get, the more all-wheel drive comes into play. With hybrid, do you have the petrol engine driving the rear wheels and the electric motors driving the front? That's an option. Do you mix and match it? Does everything drive everything? Uh, there's a lot of technological um, mastery that has to be deployed. But I think that... You know, you're right in that this isn't a true and a proper AMG in the way that they do it. However, we've said before that to a lesser extent Audi, but BMW and Mercedes-Benz have a little bit been diluting the AMG and yes. the M Sport badging by just offering packages on all yes. manner of cars, yeah, rather than just the AMG specific yep. ones. Yeah, well, I guess the issue is that this was in the States a C450 <laughs> yeah, until true. overnight it became a C43 AMG. Yeah, that's true. So... Look, I, I'll give it credit where credit's due. Um, it is a great engine. The engine is now being deployed across mm. other parts of the Mercedes-Benz range. Uh, it's fuel efficient too, which is important in a wagon. And most importantly, you have room. Yeah. The, the anomaly with SUVs is often the cargo capacity isn't actually that good. You open mm. the boot and there's barely any room in there, whereas a, a wagon retains that design that allows you to cram lots of stuff in the back. We've seen Volvo going to town on a slightly boxier design to give you more storage space, which yeah. is important to buyers yeah. in this segment. So what I really like is that storage space. That 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 rear section that we're talking about, the C four, the C class has always been slightly compromised. Yeah. So I've always been a bigger fan of the E class, even though it's a much larger vehicle. Mm. I think it makes more sense as a family vehicle. So the luggage space in this is really handy. Um, this doesn't get MBUX yet, which is that new generation of um, infotainment yep. control system. When they make that change, it'll step up again. I think overall, though, this really shows that if you look at a wagon as an alternative, there's something there really tangible to have a look at as opposed to just going out and buying an SUV. Yep. At home, advice at caradvice.com. Open up your email right now. Tell us what is your favourite wagon or what wagon did you buy mm. that we haven't talked about. We'd love to hear it. <laughs> My favourite part of the show, Paul, you know why? No. Because the readers and the viewers do the work. Yes, <laughs> so actually, that's a good yeah, We just have to answer some questions. There's no work required. Uh, the first one relates to a vehicle that's only needed to be replaced since about 1948. Yeah. So, you know, it's had, Land Rover's had the time to work on this, uh, and still it hasn't been replaced. The new Defender. I think I remember them saying somewhere it was 2018. 
Yep. As well, far as I'm aware, it's now 2019, yes. last I checked. Still no defence. They are taking their time yeah. in Trent. It's like a classic, just like you, <laughs> but not quite as old. Yeah, not quite as old. Um, thanks, this yeah. question came from <laughs> Eunice, who said, some of us die-hard real Land Rover nuts mm. are anxiously anticipating the launch of the new replacement Defender. Yep. Do you know anything about it and when we can expect it? Oh. Look, well, we've spoken to Jerry McGovern at Land Rover. He's the, he's the chief designer, of design. Yeah. We've spoken to him a million times and he always laughs. The first thing he says is he laughs. Here are the Aussies. Oh, no, they're going to ask about Defender because yep. we always do. Um, his 2IC, Massimo Fraschella, that used to work at Kia, we've asked him as well. Um, that's as recent as what we've got. I think by the look of it, that's testing at Eastner Castle, which is not far from yep. Land Rover HQ in the Midlands. Um, it's pretty heavily uh, camouflaged. I think the interesting thing for me with this vehicle is that Land Rover's on a hiding to nothing. Yep. I remember McGovern saying to us years ago when they first started talking about replacing the old Defender, Defender fans like Eunice <laughs> who emailed us, yep. they used to ring Land Rover and say, hey, this update that you've done, there's two less visible rivets. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I mean, to redesign the whole vehicle, yep. you're on a hiding to nothing, aren't you? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's something that, that is either going to work really well for them or it's going to fail miserably. Yep. And part of the reason is those die-hard fans. They want an old boxy thing. Mm. And if you look forward to how they've gone with Jeep Wrangler and yeah. Suzuki Jimny where yeah. they have pretty poor crash ratings yeah. because you can't build a box and make it safe, yeah. Land Rover has to build a box and make it safe. That's so it. this is the car that's coming in 2020. It will be launched in America to start with yeah. and then it'll be launched around the rest of the world. I actually can't wait for it because it looks awesome and yeah. knowing Land Rover, it will be incredible off-road and if old mate Jerry has anything to do with it, it'll look pretty handsome as well. Absolutely. And like a lot of cars that are that old, the old one, while it looked cool and we'd all have one in a heartbeat, yeah. was absolutely bloody awful to drive. You <laughs> needed was. to have the window down to be able to use the steering yeah. wheel. Ergonomically, it was horrendous. Um, so it needed to be replaced, as you said. We can't wait to see this next one. So stay tuned, Eunice. You'll see it at caradvice.com first, as soon as it's ready to go. <laughs> Next question, mate. An interesting one again about on-road costs. Let's, uh, let's see what we got. A question here from Frank who said, when I study the price of cars in the back of car magazines, mm. I'd add around $4,000 to get the on-road costs. Checking out the new Chev Camaro the other day, priced at $85,990, was told <laughs> an on-road $98,000. Yeah, Twelve yeah. grand for on-road costs. Is this the norm for more expensive cars? Well, the first thing there is you shouldn't be researching them in magazines. I, I didn't do any. Does anyone make magazines anymore? You can just read, yes. read caradvice.com and watch the TV show. That's what I'd be doing <laughs> if I were you. But look, that's a really good point. On-road yeah. costs are crazy. You know, we... The difficult thing for us at Car Advice is it's very hard to keep up with state to state because, of course, we go all around Australia, what that actual driveway pricing is. So we work off a list price. So with yeah. the Camaro, the list price might be $85,000, but then the yeah. driveway price is $98,000. Yeah. And a lot of viewers of this show, readers of the Car Advice website, say, what the hell are the driveway costs? Why am I paying all this extra money beyond the list price? You know what? Mm. There are some cheeky people here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'll right. tell you why. When Holden released the special editions, the Magnum, the Motorsport and the Director, mm. some dealers were adding up to ten or $15,000 dealer delivery costs. Yeah. So the recommended retail price is set by the manufacturer, yeah. but the dealer then makes up the dealer delivery costs. So all of a sudden, a Commodore that used to cost $1,500 to be delivered now cost $15,000. Mm. And this is where they make their margin. And Camaro, I suspect, is going to be in the same boat. Yep. At that price, you're paying luxury car tax as well. Yep. So there's a lot of factors to add in here, but just be careful of that final list price. You need to get it broken down on an invoice. Mm. And on that invoice, it will tell you what is costing you what and what you should be trying to avoid. And I think sometimes too, it's fair to say that you see these astronomical drive away pricings uh, with limited edition vehicles yeah. that there aren't going to be a lot of because they know they can do it. You know, we've heard of it with Bullet, with yep. the Ford Bullet Mustang. We're seeing it here with Camaro 500 examples. Um, it happens often with limited edition vehicles. And we, we spoke about Kia Cerato GT earlier in the show that the 31990 drive away price is less than the list price. So what that says is we don't expect all manufacturers to be giving away cars and not making yep. money because dealers have to make money and pay everybody's wages and be profitable as well. But in instances where this drive away pricing seems a little bit out of order, that needs to be addressed, I think. And it's not like when you go to the market, like when we're buying suits for each other. $25. Yeah, this one, you it? can't just walk away and say, well, I'd I'll go buy it somewhere else mm. because they will just go, okay, well, we'll allocate one of the 400 cars to yeah. someone else and yeah. someone else will pay. That's right. So you're kind of being held for ransom here for the car of your dreams mm. by a dealer who just wants to profiteer. So if you can agree with a dealer on a price, get it on a contract. Yes. Once you have it on, on a contract, yep. 
They can't wiggle out of that. Mm. So a signed contract is what you want. Absolutely. Let us know if you've had any of these kinds of issues with your own vehicles. Advice at caradvice.com. We're always keen to hear. And any other questions you want answered, send them in. Paul, once again, we've run out of time. Thank you. Nice suit, by the yeah. way. It's 25 bucks, yeah. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for the fashion tips. We will see you again at the same time next week, 7.30 on Wednesday nights, on Your Money.